tension sweating the fact that it came back after only 11 hours. They must have been thinking, oh my God, they didn't, that whole chart we did with all the elements, they just ignored it and said not guilty. I promise you not one of them had an idea of what the verdict was until it was read. And because of that uh, mode of thinking, prosecutors often engage in what you know we c would call overkill in the defense bar, but I understand why. I mean, they have the burden. They, that's why they march in as many experts as they can on use of force, as many experts as they can on science to absolutely button up their case because they know the defense, all the defense has to do is kick a hole in one or two elements of their crimes and that's the end of the case. It's a giant game of Jenga, you know, that game you build with blocks. The prosecution has to build the, the, the perfect building and all the defense has to do is come along like a toddler and just whack out one of the blocks and topple the whole thing. Danny, you know, we all have obviously been glued to our TV since we heard that there was a verdict. And uh, one of the family's attorneys, Benjamin Crump, said that this case should be a precedent for other cases like it in the future. But I wonder from where you sit, do you think that that's possible? We were talking earlier about how officers have a certain privilege. So is it possible to shift the precedent to something like this? Uh, I don't know that uh, a guilty conviction in a particular trial court case stands as a legal precedent, but in, certainly in terms of a societal precedent or as a, uh, a sign of a change in the times, uh, I think it certainly can be looked back on as something like that. I mean, even now we're talking about getting rid of uh, qualified immunity, you know, the, the presumptive immunity that police officers have in civil cases. This is something that I don't think anyone would have even considered five years ago. And I'm somebody who, who uh, like I said, sues police departments from time to time and has to get over the hurdle of qualified immunity. And yet I'm surprised that we're even having a discussion about getting rid of qualified immunity. It's surprising. I mean, it, it's probably a good thing for people who uh, try to keep police departments in check, but it's something I don't think we would have expected. So, I mean, does this stand as a, does this case stand as a legal precedent? Not so much, only because convictions don't stand as precedent as much as however the appeals court treats any issues that come before it. But certainly in society, it stands as a precedent uh, as we continue our increasing scrutiny of police use of force. We need to decide uh, as a society when and where and how much force is appropriate with each police citizen encounter. Because every one of these homicides, uh, murders or deaths in police custody, they all began with a, an initial stop and a police citizen encounter and escalated from there. So that's what I think we need to focus on is our overhaul of how we look at the initial encounter. Danny Savalos, thank you, sir. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Crowds gathered around the courthouse in Minneapolis as word got out that a verdict had been reached in the Derek Chauvin trial. As you can imagine, people hugged and cheered and even cried as the verdicts were read inside the courtroom. One man says he felt justice was served and it saved his city. I was really worried. I was worried about my city. Thank God my city will, will, will not burn tonight. This is, this is a new day. This is something beautiful. I'm just so happy. <laughs> I know we have a long way to go, but... We needed this today. Reaction continued. Uh, reaction continued there, continued to pour out, thank you, throughout the day. Shortly after the verdict, Floyd's family gave their thoughts. While trying to fight back tears, uh, tears of Philanise Floyd said his work fighting for justice had only just begun. The person that comes to my mind is 1955. And to me, he was the first George Floyd. That was, that was Emma Till. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I did, uh, was on CNN with Deborah Watt, and she just brought him back to life. People forgot about him. Yeah. But he was the first George Floyd. Yeah. But today, you have the cameras all around the world to see and show what happened to my brother. It was a motion picture. The world seeing his life being extinguished. And I could do nothing but watch, especially in that courtroom over and over and over again as my brother was murdered. Times, they're getting harder every day. A lot of days that I, I prayed and I hope, and I was speaking everything into existence. I said, I have faith that he will be convicted. 
President Joe Biden says the conviction of Chauvin in the killing of George Floyd can, quote, be a giant step forward for the nation in the fight against systemic racism. As we saw in this trial, serve their communities honorably. But those few who failed to meet that standard must be held accountable, and they were today. <laughs> one was. No one should be above the law. And today's verdict sends that message. For so many, it feels like it took all of that for the judicial system to deliver a just, just basic accountability. We saw how traumatic and exhausting just watching the trial was for so many people. Think about it, those of you who are listening. Think about how traumatic it was for you. You weren't there. You didn't know any of the people. But it was difficult, especially for the witnesses who had to relive that day. It's a trauma. On top of the fear so many people of color live with every day. And they go to sleep at night and pray for the safety of themselves and their loved ones. Joining me now is Shavar Jeffries, former assistant attorney general of New Jersey. Shavar, you know, we were just talking a little bit before this interview, and you said that the, the verdict went the right way. What does that mean for you? Why was this the right decision? Well, uh, based upon the evidence and testimony that was presented, as well as uh, our own eyes, what we saw over nine minutes on the video, it was clear to me that any reasonable human being uh, should have found that Chauvin commit, committed murder of George Floyd, not simply just manslaughter, which is reckless indifference of the possibility that someone may die because of someone's actions, but that his actions were specifically designed to kill uh, Mr. Floyd, and that he should be held accountable at the highest level, which is what the murder offense uh, represents. And so the evidence in the trial confirmed what we saw in the video, that Chauvin was acting beyond what was reasonable for any officer, the police chief for the Minneapolis Police Department, uh, the most senior homicide detective in that department as well, both spoke about how Chauvin's acting was beyond the scope of what is reasonable uh, for any police officer. Clearly, Chauvin's actions, despite what the defense tried to cause the death of George Floyd. So the jury did the right thing. Um, and frankly, I'm surprised. Um, and as we talked about before, um, the racial history of this country around the police killing of black people uh, is not one that gives one confidence that these juries will actually do the right thing. That's exactly what happened here. And it's a good day. And hopefully this will be a signal uh, that police officers will be held accountable uh, to the degree uh, that they take black lives and other people's lives unlawfully. So Javar, I, I wanted to ask you that, you know, in the context of what you do in, in the courtroom and what you do for social justice, does this change things? I've seen different different uh, ideologies here. I've seen some people say one verdict doesn't change anything, and I've seen people call this a turning point. How do you see this in terms of what you do actually in the courtroom? Well, I think this is definitely a positive step. I wouldn't say that this is a sea change because... You know, our criminal punishment system is very much disaggregated. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of counties throughout the country, uh, thousands and thousands of judges with different juries making decisions on a daily basis, hundreds and hundreds of prosecutors making decisions about who will be charged and who won't be charged. And so, you know, what the decision of one jury in one courtroom in one particular county in Minnesota isn't necessarily a signal of what's going to happen more broadly. However, this is an important signal. We have a multiple things here that happened that were somewhat unusual when it comes to the police uh, brutalization of black bodies. One, we had an officer fired immediately. Oftentimes, officers don't even lose their job in these situations, and Chauvin was fired within 48 hours uh, of the incident uh, uh, with respect to George Floyd. Uh, second, we had multiple officers, several officers, uh, testify against Chauvin in the trial. And I should have said, secondly, frankly, that he was even charged. We oftentimes, even if an officer loses their job, oftentimes they're not charged. And oftentimes they're not charged with murder. Sometimes it's only a manslaughter charge. So that was somewhat unusual. And then also we had officers who testified against Chauvin. Now we get a murder conviction, which is very unusual. And so my hope is that even though we have a very disaggregated criminal punishment system, this will send a signal to other prosecutors, to other juries, and hopefully to other police officers. Treat people humanely 
do the right thing. Uh, don't dishonor your badge because if you do, you might find yourself in a situation that uh, Derek Chauvin finds himself now in, which is he's been he was summarily hauled off to prison uh, right after his uh, conviction uh, this afternoon. Uh -huh.